of Christ is wisdom, and it's found in the epistle to the church of Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. This is Sunday School Lesson for November the 13th, 2022. My name is Tony Dell. And the key verse for our lesson today is found in the 18th verse of the text, and it reads as follows. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Again, this is Christ is wisdom. We are God's artwork. Amen. So the aim of this lesson is to understand how God's gift of wisdom and revelation help us to know God better, better, to understand the meaning of Christian hope as it relates to God's kingdom, to explore the power that resides within every Christian through the Holy Spirit, and to grasp what it means to be the body of Christ at home and in the world. Again, it's my YouTube channel. I ask you to please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell and you'll get my lessons automatically. Please like my lessons. Please share my lessons. Leave me comments. All of these things continue to encourage me to share this word of God with you. So as we, each week I do prepare some measure of background. We have good background this week that encompasses the definition terms, three people, history maps, and their places. Uh, you know, we're, we're again, uh, I think I like the background. It's a bit of review from last week, but I think it'll help uh, give us an on ramp to this lesson today. Amen. So one word, wisdom. Wisdom is the knowledge and determination to make choices based on principles of right living according to God's law. True wisdom views life the way God sees it with the sixth sense of faith. Wisdom is a spirit giving ability to see with discernment and to view life as God perceives it. That's this true wisdom is this, this a discernment and this God-given view as I'll share, especially as we close out this lesson, this definition. Let's move on. So the setting of this church, this letter to the church at Ephesus, uh, I shared with you the same thing last week that we are uh, going to, if we're going to properly understand the book of Ephesus, we need to understand its immediate context. Context. The church at Ephesus uh, was essential uh, to the region. The Ephesus was a big, prosperous harbor city in Asia Minor. The harbor was long and filled with, uh, filled up and uh, unusable, unusable because of the the famous Silk Road uh, to Asia ended at this point. The church at Ephesus also uh, lived in position in a community. Um, that was crowded, and it was about most, uh, but the most known for this, uh, this, uh, this idol, the mother idol of uh, Diana. It was, it was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. It was a huge uh, temple that was dedicated to this one idol, uh, 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 goddess Diana. And the people from all around flocked to this temple because this was a, a place of, of worship for the idolatry that was going on. They had uh, the streets were, were strewn with uh, immoral goddess prostitutes and, the, and it was a, a wicked city that was flooded with that uh, activity of the uh, prostitution and immorality that was going on in this city. Give you some perspective of where we are here in this city at this moment. Amen. That Paul, again, is, uh, is writing this letter to the church, and he's no doubt the writer of this book, uh, that, uh, that, that this uh, book that we're studying today, that it was uh, in 62 AD, that when he writes it, and, uh, and Paul is now here in uh, one of these prison um, letters that he's writing, that that uh, Paul wants to focus here and make sure that we know that we've done, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present dark age, and this, against spiritual forces, uh, evil forces in the heavenly places. And we need to put on the whole armor of God so we'll be able to stand against the evil one in that day and against his demons. That's what Paul wants us to convey to us and, and as we go through this this letter to the church at Ephesus, amen. 
share with you last week that was a big focus of that lesson that we are chosen by God. Just like Adam was chosen by God, he, he chose the soul before the foundation of earth, uh, before the world, and, 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 and he wanted us to be holy and, and blameless in his sight because we are important to Almighty God. Again, that's something we learned along our journey here uh, in Ephesus. Amen. Last week I shared with you that our text was like a it was like a poem, and 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 my objective here is this background is to go through that because we didn't do it last time we went through verse by verse so I'm going to go through each one of those verses from I think verses three on through the rest of that text leading to 14 leading us up to chapter verse 15 of our text today let's go through that right now Amen. So the lesson was last week that God picked you. That, uh, that here we are, then in verse 3, again, like I said, this is like pure poetry, that, that we praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love. in this love that he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves that would be Jesus amen And in him, in this Jesus, that we have this redemption that we were, were once lost because of Adam, but now we have this redemption through the blood which he shed for the forgiveness of our sins in accordance with the riches of, of God's grace. That, that he, almighty God, lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding in the riches of God's grace. He lavished his love upon us with wisdom and understanding. Amen. And he hath known, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put on effect when time reached their fulfillment with to bring unity to all things in heaven and earth in this one Christ. That is God's plan that he had for us. We would all become one in unity in heaven and on earth because of Jesus. Amen. That we are part of God's architect. That, that in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan in him who works out everything in uniformity to the purpose of this world, that God had a plan for it all, that we are a part of his architecture, right? In order that we, who were the first to be put on, the first to put on our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory, that it, all of it was done because of the glory of God, that we would, we are predestined and God gets the glory for all that transpires in our life. Again, this beautiful poem. Let's move on. Did God pick you when you were chosen before the foundation of the earth? You ultimately were adopted into God's family and given all the rights of inheritance. And, and you were included in Christ when you heard this message of truth, the gospel of our salvation. When you believed, you were marked and sealed and marked in him with the seal. That is that Holy Spirit that now indwells us all believers who depositing this, in, this guaranteed inheritance that we now have this inheritance. We are ultimately adopted into the family of God and we have this inheritance until this redemption. That we who are God's possession, we now belong to God, to his play, praise and his glory. That is this prayer. Let's close off this prayer with a portion that I closed out last week as well. Amen. It's not a part of that poem, but it's a part of this this whole concept that I that I, I share with you that in chapter two, four, we are God's workmanship, His own master work, a work of art created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready for use for good works. 
which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set. So we will walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. The word of God, of the people of God. Amen. Last week, Paul told the Ephesians that they were chosen before the foundation of the earth. And, and when they chose Jesus, they were sealed with the Holy Spirit, right? Adopted into the family of God, receiving all of the benefits of being in that family of God. And, and today's lesson, Paul is thankful he has this measure of gratitude that I'll share with you along our journey today for us, for them, right? For us. And, and for this reason, Paul is hopeful for our future, for the future of the church in Ephesus for us as well. And in this lesson, Paul desires that God will endow the church here with that spirit of wisdom and revelation. And I hope that you, along our journey today, find the spirit of Almighty God and, and the revelation of God and who he is and who Jesus is and, and what God has for you in this Christian life. That's our hope. Amen. So background, about 12 minutes of background. Let's jump on into this lesson. Amen. For Sunday school lesson, Christ is wisdom is our subject. And we're in uh, Ephesians chapter one, continuing on from chapter one last week. And this week I'm gonna use uh, chapter one, 15 through 23. And this week, I'm going to do something I haven't done in a while. I'm going to use the Amplified. I think it really works for this lesson. We're continuing the theme from last week, so I think it, it works for what we're trying to accomplish here and just getting everybody some clarity. Here's the thing that I, I know that, you know, the King James, where a lot of folks love to go, and, and but here's the thing that, that 95 or 97 percent of all the translations all have the same theme. There's just some little pieces and uh, that that may be different here or there but but if we sprinkle all of the the, the essence of of god's revelation to us it's all they're going to say essentially the same so it's not like one is it's so much superior when we're studying a lesson that i want clarity i don't want to give you a bunch of terms and, and 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 things that that we have to go through so much in order to decipher that sometimes just the clarity of the word is what helps us and that's what we're doing the amplified today is a continuation where we were last week in paul's letter continues paul's statement of prayer is what he's saying here and this declaration of thanksgiving that he has for us in verse 15 and for this reason that I share with you that led us all up to this point, I have heard of your faith. Paul writing to his church at, at Ephesus, right? Paul is in prison at this moment, like I shared with you before this was one of the prison, prison letters that he write. And Paul said, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. That's verse 15 and verse 16. And I do not cease to give thanks Remembering you in my prayers, God. Paul is is telling this people that that I I I I, I remember you. I remember. I want you to know that I'm thinking about you all the time because I, I know I heard about your faith, but but I've also heard about your love for God's people. It's magnified at that point as we move on to the next cell. Amen. Paul gives thanks to the congregation, not for the love for God, but for their, more importantly, for their love for all of the saints. And, and he recognizes that the real evidence of God's work in us is not the love we claim we have for God, but the love we claim for the people, that others can see that love. And, and I share with you John 4, verses 20 through 21. If someone says, I love God, but hates his brother or sister, that person is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So Christ has given us this commandment, right? Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Again, magnifying what Paul just said to this church here in Ephesus. Amen. So Christ is wisdom in verse 17 of our text. Paul is praying that they would know 
God. And they and here again in the Amplified, it reads as follows, verse 17, and I always pray. And everything you see in parent parentheses are here that those are, are texts that are not necessarily a part of the text, but they're meant here to magnification. Again, this is an amplified version, right? And Paul says, I always pray that God, our Lord, that pray that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may grant you a spirit of wisdom. And Paul wants these people to have this wisdom, this wisdom from God. And the revelation that gives you a deep and personal, legitimate insight. Again, that's what we're, we're here about this, this spirit of wisdom and revelation, right? And that gives you a deep and personal and intimate insight in the pure knowledge of him. For we know the Father through the Son. And that's how we have, we know, listen, that, that, that when we talk about the, uh, the Trinity, the Trinity that God has revealed himself to man in three distinct personalities, right? In the person of the Father, in the person of the Son, in the person of the Word that would be, became made flesh, that Son, the Word in the bosom of the Father before the foundation of the Word, the Word, the Word that spoken all that was not became. And the very Spirit that Shekinah, that, that dwell with man in many times throughout history, that, that those, that is the the, the essence of Almighty God, that we know that 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 we would know the Father through the Son, and all that Jesus has shared with His three and a half year ministry was so that we would understand the God and more. And that's His purpose as well. We know about this wisdom. Let's magnify this wisdom. Next Sunday, man. If we got wisdom. God was a source of all of the wisdom. We we know we go back to Solomon. And Solomon, when he when he was the wisest man in the world, right? The wisest man and one of the most richest man that ever existed. But one of the things that he that he he said he asked God. He says that God, he, he put him in a position that 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 King David was his father, and and now that he would now lead the people. And what he said that he needed to be able to do it efficiently. And and he asked for one thing, and he asked for wisdom. And God is the source of all wisdom. All the other wisdom is all from the principalities and powers, but God's wisdom is true, more powerful, and rich. Amen. Let's move on. Christ is wisdom in verses 18 and 19a of this text. And again, uh, from the Amplified, and I pray, again parenthetically, I pray that the eyes of your heart, the center and core of your being, may be enlightened, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, flooded with the light of the Holy Spirit, so that you will know and cherish the hope, the divine guarantee and confident expectation which you are called, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you will know and cherish the hope to which you, uh, which he has called you, the riches of his glory and inheritance in the saints, that that, that that hope is, and him calling is this uh, perspective on the future. That the believer has a the future of a resurrection. That that's this this hope of this inheritance, right? That we have this hope of a resurrection. We have this hope of eternal life. We have the freedom from sin. We have the perfect justification because of what Jesus did. We have this glorious elevation because who we are now, and we are now made a little bit above those angels because God loves us that much, right? Verse 19, so that you will begin to know what is the immeasurable, the immeasurable and God's people's unlimited surpassing greatness of his power in us, his active spiritual power in us who believe, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know and cherish the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and saints, what immeasurable and God's people unlimited surpassing the greatness of his power in us who believe. God wants us to know that we are important, that he has something great for us, and God has given us these riches of his glorious inheritance, and I'll share with you that in the next cell. Amen. 
that God has given us these gifts of the spirit, right? That is this wisdom and this understanding, all these riches of his glorious inheritance of the saints, all because of our relationship we have with Jesus and we have this understanding. And it has this right judgment and courage and knowledge and piety and reverence, all because of our interaction with this Jesus. And Paul wants his church to know in Ephesus that, that we have the riches of his glory and this inheritance that we receive because of our relationship with this Jesus. Amen. Verses 19b and 21 of our text. And Paul is exalted. Jesus is exalted for what he did at the cross. And we got these gifts because of his sacrifice. Those gifts I just shared with you. These are in accordance, in accordance with the working of his mighty strength. In which he produced, in which he produced in Christ. When he raised him from the dead. When God raised this Jesus from the dead. And he seated him at his own right hand. That's the image I have in the background. That, the, that Jesus is now and, and died and gone to the and, and, and gone to the cross and, and he was resurrected and, and, and he was seen by man for that uh, 40 days or so right but but again at that point that he that he that he went back to God and, and now he is seated at the right hand of God the Father I'm going to magnify this right hand of the next cell in the heavenly places verse 21 far above the rule and authority and the power and dominion, whether angelic or human, that, that, that this position that Jesus now sits at is far above any of the other authority that one would know, far above every other name that is the name is above every title that can be confused, can be conferred, that it was his king or a ruler or emperor or whatever, that he is far above any of those not only in this age, and and, it, and again, it all, all the ages in the past and all the ages to come, that Jesus sitting on the right hand of God the Father is more glorious, that, that, that he is more uh, magnificent because of his title and where he is at this moment. Let's magnify this right hand one more time as we move on. Amen. Who be the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power that we had when he had by himself purged our sins that he that he, he went to that cross and he got up he, and, and, and then he went back to the father and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high the right hand is seen as a place of honor and status throughout the biblical text when the Bible makes statements that Jesus sits on the right hand of the Father, it is affirming that he is an equal status with the Father within the Godhead. That is his whole understanding of who he is and what he did at the cross. And now he's sitting in his exalted position. He was one and three. So Paul is trying to help us to understand this whole concept of Jesus and who he is and what he has done for us. Amen. Christ's wisdom in verses 22 and 23, the last two printed verses of our text. And, 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 and he put all things in, the, in every realm. Again, God is speaking here that, that, that he put all things in, the, in, the, uh, in, in every realm in subject under Christ's feet. That God did this. When, when Jesus went back to glory, God put him at the right hand and God put all things in every realm in subject in subjection under Christ's feet and appointed him as the supreme authority over all things in the church, which is his body, fulfillment of him who fills and completes all things and all believers that Jesus is this head of the church and God put him in all things in every realm. All the things in the world are all under Christ's feet. He has the supreme authority of all things in the church because he is the head of the church. <coughs> Excuse me, I think I have two cells to close. Let's move on to close out this lesson. That the Adam all died, right? That we all got the sin nature because of Adam. 
And even so, in Christ, we shall all be made alive, right? Because our, our, our connection back with God for what Adam broke, Jesus fixed. For he, Jesus, must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. But ultimately, the principalities and the powers and Satan, the Antichrist, and those who follow him will all be put under his feet. That the last enemy shall be destroyed in his death. That Almighty God has put all things in every realm of subjection under Jesus' feet. And appointed him as a supreme and authoritative figure in the church. God has given him the authority. Jesus sits in power, sits in his seat of authority at the right hand of Almighty God. Amen. We have one more cell after this, Paul once. The Ephesian church and us today to know that Jesus has been exalted in heaven and that the angels and glory and the archangels are subject to him and the believing men are joined to him that will be us right with an incredible union by his name the same message this the same messenger who is Jesus that we all are connected and we are connected to God because of him because we are called to be one in Christ because he is the one who is the one who redeemed us this exalted one in heaven is our Messiah, the one who has elevated us, the one who has given us this Holy Spirit that resides within us, the one that's given us this wisdom and all of those other attributes that we would have, right? Because of Jesus and our relationship with him. One more cell to close. Amen. We're talking about this wisdom, right? Wisdom is a spirit given ability to see with discernment and the view life as God perceived it. That's where I started you with this whole definition of what this this wisdom is. That is this the spirit given ability to see with discernment. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, right? If it's from God, it has to be pure. It's it's peaceable, right? It's gentle. It's easily entreated. It's easily of uh, 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 interacted with, right? Is, in ease, is easily uh, intertwined with us, full of mercy and good fruits. And I share with you those fruits of the Spirit, right? Without partiality, that everybody gets it equally. Without hypocrisy, that God gives it not one before, one more than another. We all receive these gifts of the Spirit. And I share with you, man and woman, woman of God, that when you choose Jesus, you get the most incredible wisdom possible. And that is God's wisdom. That spirit given ability to see with discernment and view life as God sees it. The word of God for the people of God. And that is our Sunday school lesson this week. And my prayer that some people learn this week, strengthen your faith, the Lord provides all your needs. You learn something worthy of sharing. So in the matchless name of Jesus, I do pray and ask these things always. In this person's name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for your time.